Hello. Let's just check that people can hear me, first of all. I, I can my, hear you. My audible yeah. and even next check is, are my slides changing? Yes, your slides are changing. That's good. I've had some technical issues recently, so I thought you'd better check on that. Well, thank you very much, uh, everybody. It's it's wonderful to be here. I'm I'm so sorry I wasn't around for some of the earlier talks. I'm afraid it's I've been joys of Saturday, Saturdays. It means parental taxi duties uh, got in the way this morning. Um, it's, it was, I was able to catch the end of Adrian's talk, and it, it's it's quite nice to hear him mention mention Lindisfarne and one of the the interesting or uh, one of the joys of working on early medieval Lindisfarne at the moment is that there's so much other interesting work going on on sites with this period so obviously the, the work at Whithorn the work at Iona which both of which Adrian's been involved with uh, allows us to actually start really comparing the sites uh, across what you might call Middle Britain uh, in, in in this period, and it's it's great to see a kind of dialogue going on with with new field work and revisiting old field work, which means that the kind of understanding of the early medieval church is really it, it really feels vibrant at the moment. It's a very exciting uh, area to be working in. So what I want to do today is think about understanding the early medieval monastic site of Lindisfarne and Holy Island, uh, which is a, a site most of you will be broadly familiar with. One of the exciting things is that at the moment, um, with the combination of archaeological work, work going on uh, on geoarchaeology, work going on re-examining sculpture, and work going on re-engaging with historical texts, is that we're seeing quite a, a, a radical transformation of our understanding of what's happening on Lindisfarne uh, and um, when it's happening uh, in, in, in particular. And, and many of our, our, our changing our transformations are, are kind of, again, reflecting some of these, these broader debates going on across uh, early medieval, the, the study of early medieval Christianity in, in Atlantic and North Sea, in North Sea Britain. So what I want to do today is explore how Lindisfarne and the cult of St Cuthbert, which are, are um, kind of entities which traditionally we thought we understood, we thought we had a good, nice, clear uh, narrative, how those narratives are starting to fall apart and how we are starting to try and put new narratives in their place. I want to have a little look about how, think about how archaeology um, could relate to textual sources, because one of, one of the exciting things is that archaeology opens up new perspectives and tells new stories that, that traditional historical sources don't even begin to engage with. Um, and, 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 and just think about this, how really these processes, uh, as we've seen with, with, with Adrian's talk, we are, we are truly interdisciplinary. We're, we're, we're using traditional archaeological fieldwork, we're using art history, we're using scientific approaches, we're using re-examination of, of texts to kind of make some quite radical transformations in, in our understanding of sites like Lindisfarne. So I'm going to break this down into a kind of series of, 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 of acts, as it were. Um, we're going to be, I'm, I'm going to start off by, by setting the scene, providing a little bit of context about Lindisfarne and the, the, tra the traditional understanding for it. Then we'll have a look at what's happening uh, on the island in, in the immediate run up to the foundation of the monastery. We'll look at the uh, monastery act two in, in the height, the golden age of Northumbria, as it's sometimes called. And then we'll look at the um, what I used to call the afterlife of the monastery, but I don't even think using that term afterlife is, is, is particularly useful because it's increasingly clear that Lindisfarne just keeps on going and just won't stop. Uh, the traditional idea that the Vikings put a put a kind of um, stop to 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 monastic presence on Lindisfarne really just is no longer sustainable. So I'll talk about but I'll talk about those later phases of what's going on at the island as well. So here are here are your dates. These are about the only dates you're going to get from me uh, at this stage. Um, we have a broad understanding of the, the key historical points with Lindisfarne based on a, a collection of, of, of textual sources for the understanding of the early phases of Lindisfarne up to um, the kind of mid 8th century. We've primarily got uh, Bede, who obviously writes his ecclesiastical history, but also writes to um, to uh, lives of St. Cuthbert, and there's a further anonymous life of St. Cuthbert. And they provide us with, with, a, with the broad contours of the early stages of the history of Lindisfarne. Then um, with Bede, our, our key source disappears, and, and the sources we have for the later understanding of Lindisfarne are, are a little bit more 
complicated, a little bit more hazy, and this is something I'll, I'll be coming back to later on. Um, but if we look at the broad kind of um, the broad outline of, of the story, we, we know that uh, the monastery on Lindisfarne is founded in AD 635, uh, at the point when King Oswald, who was an heir to the throne of Northumberland, comes, comes into his kingship. He's been in exile in Western Scotland, uh, where he's converted to Christianity. His, um, his uncle was, was King Edwin, uh, which, which meant that Oswald was a, 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 a likely heir to, to the Northumbrian throne, which made him made his life very dangerous. So obviously Edwin would probably try and eliminate as many heirs as possible. So Oswald spends time in exile. And when he comes back to, to Northumbria, he brings with him uh, uh, monks from Iona, connections from Iona, where he's almost certainly converted to, to Christianity. And we have about 30 years where Lindisfarne is essentially a daughter house of Iona. Um, but that all changes in AD 664 when we have the Synod of Whitby. There's a huge amount that can be said about the Synod of Whitby. But essentially, the situation is that the Kingdom of Northumbria, the Royal Court of Northumbria, has uh, people who are following the Ionan tradition of Christianity, uh, which has different dates of celebration of things like Easter to the more Roman tradition of Christianity, which is also being followed in the Northumbrian court. And the Synod of Whitby is essentially a relatively local decision by the kings of Northumbria about which broad tradition of Christianity uh, the Northumbrian court is going to follow. And the upshot of this is that they opt with the more Roman tradition rather than the Ionian tradition of, of Lindisfarne, um, which leads to a kind of major transfer of change of personnel of, of, of the monastic, monastic community. Um, and and uh, Lindisfarne becomes part of the kind of more, more mainstream Northumbrian uh, and Anglo-Saxon Anglo -Saxon church. The, the, that, that's, that's to whip through that narrative very, very quickly. But, that, but that's the, um, the, the broad consequences of that. In practical terms, what, what, what in, in, in the kind of medium term, the um, one, one of the outcomes of this is that uh, we see Cuthbert coming in as a senior senior figure within the monastic community at Lindisfarne. Um, Cuthbert is a kind of ideologically clean skin. He's not too associated with the Irish church. He's, he's, he's kind of firmly part of the Roman church. He's associated uh, with both a, uh, a life of holiness. He, spend, he, he likes spending time as a hermit, but also clearly he's, he's a good political operator as well. So Cuthbert comes in, hold, holds some senior, senior posts within the community of, of Lindisfarne, uh, but he, he, he has this drive to be a hermit. He spends time as a hermit out on Inner Farn, a small coastal island just off Lindisfarne, uh, where he frankly does the best thing possible for, for Lindisfarne, and that's he dies, because he provides Lindisfarne with a new, a new saint. Uh, as, as we heard earlier on, early medieval monasteries tend to have a central saint, which are, are the focus for devotion and, and cult activity. Um, at Lindisfarne, it was Aidan was probably as a founder was probably the original saint, but the, the challenge is he was associated with the Irish Church rather than the, the Roman kind of Anglo-Saxon Frankish Church. So Cuthbert kind of comes in and acts as this new a new um, a new founder essentially. Um, so it's the cult of Cuthbert that really becomes the focus for subsequent devotional activity. Uh, he dies in six eight seven. He, he says he wanted to be very buried on in a farm, but he's brought over to, to, to Lindisfarne itself. He's buried in, in a position of honour in the church and following the usual kind of protocol, his body is exhumed from the ground after about 10 years. As is usual, he is found to be miraculously incorrupt. And at that point, his body is raised out of the ground into a shrine above the ground, uh, a process called translation. And that is the de facto way in which one becomes a saint in the Anglo-Saxon church, in the early medieval church. It's a process of, of acclamation. So we then see a series of activities around the promotion of the cult of Cuthbert. I think arguably we can see evidence for replanning and rebuilding in the monastery. Um, and it's probably connected to this that the Lindisfarne Gospels are created as part of a broader push to promote the cult of Cuthbert. 
So this is really the, the period of what's called the, the golden age of Northumbrian Christianity. Uh, it's uh, Lindisfarne acquires huge amounts of land. It becomes very, very wealthy. The cult of Cuthbert becomes internationally important. And everything is going swimmingly for about 100 years. And then we have the first Viking attack in 793. And this is almost, but not quite, the first Viking attack on, on Britain. Um, because it's such an early attack, it got a lot of a lot of uh, commentary. It, it, uh, Alquin hears about it in, in uh, Carolingian Europe. He writes about it. Uh, it's obviously reported in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles. Um, and an awful lot of weight is put to this first attack, though it's actually quite clear that the monastery survives it quite effectively. Uh, and the monastery keeps on, keeps on going after that first Viking attack. We then have a point where the uh, narrative gets a bit more contentious. Uh, the traditional narrative which is based on a document being written in the community of St. Cuthbert in Durham in the 11th and 12th century, suggests that around 830 to 845, the community uh, move inland to a site called Norham, which is just up the Tweed. It's about 15 miles away. And they bring with them a, a wooden church, probably or possibly Aidan's wooden church. They bring with them a stone cross. They bring with them some relics. The narrative is hazy because we then get a second narrative of a second departure from Lindisfarne in 875. Um, and it's, it, it's, it's said that this is to avoid the Vikings, to, to, to retreat from the Viking attacks. And that's something I'll perhaps come back to later on. We then have a, a narrative of the monastic community, the community of St. Cuthbert, moving around the north of England. Uh, they, they go around kind of central, central southern Scotland, northern Northumbria. They, they make an attempt to go over, allegedly an attempt to go over to Ireland. They go over to Workington. Uh, there's a, a series of miracles which, which forces them back. And after a, 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 around a century at Chesterley Street, they finally end up in Durham. That, and that is the, the traditional conventional narrative. And that's one I will be coming back to a little bit later on. And finally, the story has it that the monks then refound a new monastery back on Lindisfarne uh, in, uh, following the Norman conquest. So that is the story you will read on exhibition panels, uh, guidebooks, popular histories. But I think we can start to start to challenge that through the archaeology. Um, let's have a little think about the island itself before we get stuck into the, the archaeology in more detail. Um, most of you will know where Lindisfarne is. It's up here off the northeast coast of Northumberland. It's now about kind of 10, 15 miles south of the Tweed, which is the Anglo-Scottish border, though it's important to remember that for most of this period, the Anglo-Scottish border has no meaning, that the Kingdom of Northumbria goes all the way up to the, to the Firth of Forth and, and, and well over to the west. So it's, it's not a, that's, that, that's not, that, that modern boundary is not of particular importance for the understanding of, of Lindisfarne. Um, it's often seen as a Kind of remote or, or isolated location. It's really not. It's sitting in the middle of important sea lanes. It's uh, connect. It's very close to major Roman roads heading up, heading up north towards the Tweed. It's quite a centrally located um, place. The island itself is tidal, and we know it was tidal even at the time of Bede, because Bede writes very clearly about that. Um, it's a low-lying island. It's there have been some changes to the island since, since the early medieval period. Now, the sea level itself hasn't changed that much, but we have seen some minor changes to the uh, shape of the island due to um, land reclamation, essentially. If you look down on this map, you can see the area marked as the village. And the, the, the early medieval monastery is broadly under the village and under the, 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 later, the later priory. But you can see to the east of the village, there is a, a darker green crescent of, of land. And that area was actually open water. It was a tidal lagoon until the 18th century. So originally, the early medieval monastery would have very much been on not just on an island, but on a headland surrounded by water on three sides. It, was, it would have only had a dry boundary, dry boundary to the north. Um, work ongoing by Raphael Kallenberg, who's one of our PhD students in Durham, is doing a lot of work on picking the, the, the change, constantly shifting landscape of, of Lindisfarne. But it's clear that much of the central island, centre of the island was quite low lying, um, very poorly drained. The, the, the lake or the luff, as it's called, would have probably been quite, quite substantially larger. The other major change, another major change with the island are the sand dunes on the north. The sand dunes nowadays, those of you who know the Northumbrian coast, uh, sand dunes dominate really from, from kind of Berwick 
all the way down to, to Bambra, they're a key part of, of, of the what brings people to, to the coast today. Um, but they are largely a late medieval, post medieval um, uh, uh, phenomenon caused by the stormy conditions of the Little Ice Age. It's quite clear that uh, in, in multiple places, those sand dunes can be seen overlying um, earlier medieval, early medieval remains. So we can be fairly happy that those sand dunes weren't in place uh, at this period. Um, also, access routes to the island have changed. It's always been traditionally that when the tide's down, you could walk across. Nowadays, the uh, main access to the route is along um, the kind of just, just just off the edge of this picture, but uh, it runs along the uh, across from a village called Beale, a farm called Beale, and it's 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 been tarmacked, and there's a road which kind of runs along the southern coast of the island, coming round to the village. Again, it's clear from earlier mapping that there are multiple causeways, uh, multiple multiple routes across across those sands to to the village. And actually, the main route probably ran west from the village straight to a, a west from the village of Holy Island straight to a village called Fenham, which was the uh, estate centre on the mainland of the block of lands called Islandshire, which were owned by the monastery and that's almost certainly the main most common route uh, through most of the island's history. So let's have a look at the uh, history of the archaeology on the island. There's, unlike say Monk Wearmouth and Jarrow or, or Whithorn or, or many other early medieval monastic sites, Lindisfarne has actually seen surprisingly little archaeological work until relatively recently. There's a little bit of late 19th early 20th century work done by a local landowner who was essentially it was more landscaping than archaeology, where he's clearing out the rubble of the ruins of the later priory. And there's a little bit of work done by the Ministry of Works in the 1920s. But again, that was very much focusing on the upper layers of the later medieval monastery down here in the south of the south of the, um, of the village. After that, there's no substantial field work till the 1960s. The first phase in the 1960s is done by Brian Hope Taylor. Some of you may be familiar with him from his work, at, groundbreaking work at Yevering, really important archaeological work at Yevering, uh, the major palatial site inland, uh, about 20 miles west of, of Lindisfarne. He literally finished at, at uh, uh, Yevering and came straight from Yevering straight to Holy Islands in 1962, in September 1962. And whatever he was doing when he crossed that causeway, he completely lost his archaeological mojo. He went from doing some amazing groundbreaking archaeology at Yevering to some very ineffective interventions on, on Lindisfarne. He dug a series of slit trenches rather than his the big open area excavation for which he's better known uh, to the west of the uh, west of the this field uh, to the west of the parish church, and he hit mainly hit later medieval archaeology, but there are hints that there might be earlier stuff underneath it. He also rather ineffectively attempted to dig a, a rectangular earthwork structure, which could be seen as earthworks up on the the rocky uh, hoof, which is this rocky crag running along the south of the island. Um, he yeah, he, he basically failed to find the structure. He found he thought he had a rectangular rubble turf structure, but as we'll see, later excavation revealed that wasn't quite what was happening. Um, there's then small bits of archaeology, 1977, when the visitor centre was constructed, Deirdre O'Sullivan excavated. The visitor centre is just here. And what came clear from her work is that the bulk of the, the later village of Holy Island sits on essentially a large medieval and post medieval midden. Um, there's a huge amount of material, a good meter and a half plus of, of later stratigraphy to get down to before you start hitting the earlier medieval remains. Um, so most of her work was working through later, later material. Uh, there's other excavations uh, on the um, uh, in 2000 excavations under the uh, what's now the Mead shop and again that found essentially large quantities of, of midden material. There had been a, a bigger research excavation, a research project run by Deirdre O'Sullivan and, and Rob Young in the late 80s and early 90s but they focused more broadly on the landscape and in particular on a site called Green Shield on the north side of the island which is early medieval it's a fascinating site but it wasn't part of the, the, the kind of monastic the monastic core there's been a small quantity of sub, 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 uh, subsequent archaeology done through commercial planning archaeology when people put in having pipes and, and buildings put in uh, most recently up here uh, in 2006, uh, when a couple, little bit of social housing was constructed, uh, they found hints of um, 
what could be early medieval archaeology. But frustratingly, although it's only 2006, the archives have disappeared. Um, then, um, yeah, thinking about the planning archaeology is one site I haven't got on the map, which is actually even further, just up here north of this car park, where in the last six months, uh, uh, the remains of a, of a cemetery of probable early medieval, or sorry, probable medieval or early medieval date has, has come up. More recently still, there's been work done by a community uh, heritage lottery funded project around a number of sites on the island, but in particular, they excavated up here on the hoof and they found a number of traces of early medieval activity, which I'll, I'll hopefully come back to later on. Which brings us to the project I've been involved with since 20, 2016, uh, where I've been working with my collaborators, Dig Ventures, on a uh, 10 year, it'll be a 10 year project by the time we finish, really focusing in on the monastic archeology span of the early medieval period. And we dug a series of trenches both to the, the east of the main priory. We've done some smaller evaluation trenches and a, and a trench to the, to the west of the village. Um, these were, this was informed by a, a big geophysical survey, which we did a year or two before that. Um, and what became clear was that actually, if we excavated outside the core of the village, we didn't have to contend with the big medieval and post-medieval midden deposits. We were able to open up our trenches and come more or less straight down onto early medieval archaeology, which is very, very pleasing. So um, that's where we are at the moment. We are, I'm just planning our eighth season, which will be up back out on the island in September. There are practical challenges with digging in somewhere like Lindisfarne. It's a very, very busy island. It's a very tourist driven island. So that means there's all sorts of practical issues, plus working around the tide. So we tend to have quite short seasons. Um, we are obviously in the middle of the project, so post excavation work is ongoing. So everything I'm going to say now is, is, is provisional. Um, we also do a lot of digital recording. All, all, all our recording is almost entirely non paper based. We, we do everything digitally using you know tablets and, and that kind of thing which which means our archives are quite accessible if anybody's interested i can i can share a link to those later on so what do we know about lindisfarne before before the the monastery um there are we, we know the islands occupied you know, way back into the mesolithic period and, and there, there's clearly a a, 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 a a iron age presence on the island and there's a small number of roman roman finds bearing in mind we're well north of hadrian's wall the, the first kind of evidence for textual, textual evidence we have for activity comes from a, a reference in the Historia Bretonum talking about activity in, in the later 6th century, where in, 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 in a passage which is a bit difficult to translate, but it, it broadly implies that we have four um, British kings, so we, these are Welsh-speaking kings of, of northern, northern England and southern Scotland, who are contending against uh, a, a burgeoning English Anglo-Saxon uh, polity in the area. We have reference. We have references to these kings Irien and River and Gwachlaug and Mordkant, who are fighting against the the king, the Anglo-Saxon king Theodoric, and we have references to a siege or blockade of um, of Lindisfarne. Uh, and most translations imply that it's the Anglo-Saxons being besieged by the British, although some translations have it the other way around. So it's not the, the, the niceties aren't entirely clear. I I suspect, and this is something we're kind of working on, is that when, when they're talking about a siege, we're actually not talking about a siege of the island, we're talking about a siege of the castle. Um, Lindisfarne Castle, now the castle itself is, is uh, post-medieval, but it's precisely the kind of craggy outcrop which was regularly used in early medieval British contexts as um, for kind of hill forts, essentially. Closest by, we've got Bambra, which is the best example, but you know, there's lots of other sites, Dumbarton, Dinad, um, it, it, it's part of the kind of cultural, cultural milieu. Uh, we, we're hoping to do some field work on, on that area uh, in, in future years, but there is at least one fragment of uh, early medieval metalwork which has been recovered from the castle, the castle rock. So it's certainly hinting of some kind of activity, activity there. We also starting to, I think, to identify a potential pre-monastic signature through our archaeological excavation. So this is very much work in work in progress. Um, here we have a, a, a little aerial drone shot of our, sorry, a photogrammetric model of our um, two of our trenches from. This is actually about 
couple of years ago, 2019. Um, and there's lots going on. Uh, later on, we're going to home in and lots of activity in here. There's lots of burials going on. But for a long time, one of the kind of elephants in the room in our this little trench on the right was this great big stone wall, which was just kind of sitting there. And I think for a long time, we thought it's probably later um post-dating the, the the main phase of, of the monastery but increasingly we're starting to reevaluate that late date uh, here we see it a little bit more clearly we've got this big stretch of wall it's about two meters wide um there were it is clear evidence that it carried on to the north we we this is a kind of post x pro a photo where some of the other stones been removed clearly kept on going to the north uh and in more recent seasons we've actually got a carbon 14 date from a See that big dark smudge there? That's a, that's a deposit of charcoal. And um, we were expecting all sorts of potential dates. We certainly weren't expecting, though, a date of um, four three hundred to six hundred. So no matter how you, that's that's at two sigma, so ninety six percent accuracy. Um, so that's clearly pre monastic, given the monastery is founded in six three five. So it does seem to suggest that the charcoal smudge and probably the wall, not certainly, probably the wall may be connected to something going on at the, at, at the site pre, pre-monastic. And obviously this immediately takes us back to what we were hearing about from, from Adrian with the idea that many of these monastic sites have a secular phase going on and that when land is granted to religious communities, these lands are probably estates with existing farming and uh, settlement centres on them. So maybe it was starting to identify a, a pre-monastic phase. Um, what's interesting in, in, in the more recent uh, excavations, as we've extended our trench to the, to the left, our, our, our trench to west, you can see walls on the same alignment are coming up again further to the north. So there, and you can see it all, sorry, it's very crude, crude, crude graphics, but you can see we've got a really substantial long wall crossing our site. And crucially, it, what's clear is that this wall is the stratigraphically earliest thing we've got. Even if we can't be confident about that C14 date, this wall seems to precede everything else in our excavations. It doesn't cut any of the later burials. Um, even more recently, in, our, in my latest season, we can see the wall continued going further north, We've now got some really well constructed stone. And from under a fraction of wall, we've got our, our, our first and only fragment of um, Roman terrace and gelata. So, I mean, the big question is, is what is this? And that's not a rhetorical question. What is it? I, I, I think none of, us, none of us know at this stage. It does seem to be pre monastic. What is throwing us slightly, I think, is that we wouldn't, normally one wouldn't expect to see such substantial stone walls on a, on a secular site or indeed any kind of site in AD kind of 500 to 600. It doesn't kind of fit in with what we know about secular building traditions, which are largely uh, post-built uh, this period. Um, so we're still trying to understand it. And we've just got funding uh, for a new set of carbon-14 dates from charcoal within and beneath the wall makeup, which will hopefully help us refine those, refine those dates. But we're still trying to work out what's going, what's going on there. So this is a classic example of not knowing what we've got yet. So you can have to wait. <laughs> I will share the C14 dates once, once we get those. But that Kind of putting that aside, most of our most of our excavations are focusing in on what is essentially a, a large cemetery, which is fits in nicely due to based on a series of C14 dates to the eighth, ninth century and and a bit later. Uh, and you can see on both of our our main trenches, uh, there are burials absolutely everywhere. And if you home in, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna home in on this area on the bottom right and just give you a get. get get a sense of the density of burial. Here we've got, our, obviously you can see our nice three kind of uh, skeletons here, which have been excavated and are about to be removed. But the more you look, there's skulls, 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 another skull, 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 skull. Now, it, 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 it's this kind of meshwork of, um, of, of greys all cutting into each other, huge amounts of um, but bone charnel floating around. Most graves contain bits of other graves which have clearly been cut through and then the earlier bones been chucked back in. So incredibly dense um, 
uh, densely occupied cemetery. We have yet to find the edges. We've put trenches into the north and everywhere we open up, open up a, a new trench, we find more burials. It's getting quite, it's getting quite frankly, quite frustrating. Um, so it's clearly a very substantial and long-lived cemetery. Some of the some of the carbon fourteens go as late as the late as the twelfth century, uh, and those late dates I'm going to come back to. So a very densely settled, very densely um, occupied cemetery. Um, Broadly speaking, we can characterize, I mean, these, these are quite simple graves. They are, we've got no evidence for kind of the cool, cool stuff Adrian's, Adrian was talking about earlier on with the tree trunk graves and that kind of thing. Vast majority of our graves are simply placed in the ground, head to the west, foot to the east, virtually no evidence of coffins with one or two exceptions we'll come back to. Uh, they're, they, they're kind of hunched up, as you can see on the, on the one to the, on to the the skeleton on the left, which kind of implies, I think, that most of them are going into the ground, ground in in shrouds. Most are on their back. There's a small group who are actually found buried on their sides, and these tend to be the earlier ones. And but there are quite good parallels to that from places like Cumbrian sites. There's, there are other hints of varied burial traditions. We've got quartz pebbles absolutely everywhere. Um, I suspect these are probably originally in piles on top of the graves, but because of that dense intercutting, they've just become mixed up with the, the underlying, with the graveyard soil. Certainly though, they are intrusive and we haven't been able to find anywhere on the island where quartz pebbles exist in, in naturally. So they've clearly been brought to the island in, and put in the cemetery. We've got a small number of, of stone line graves as well. Uh, but to go back, you can see this feature here with the, the, the lintels on top. That was a that was a small grave. So we've got a kind of a, a, a fair, you know, more or less what one would expect from a, from a, a, a cemetery of this state in this part of the world. We've also been getting um, fragments of uh, sculpture, uh, and even before the carbon fourteen dates came back, that 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 kind of said to us that we were probably in an early medieval area. Now there's quite a big sculptural assemblage from Lindisfarne, most of which is just kind of always been there, it's been in the churchyard, been in the church, probably found through grave digging in the parish church, which is just to the west of our trenches. Um, a distinctive feature of that big sculptural assemblage is these uh, name stones. These are quite small, maybe about the size, the biggest ones are about the size of an A4 pad of paper. Um, and they're quite consistent in shape. They've got these rounded heads, they have crosses on them, they have names on them, usually in Latin script, a small number in runic scripts. Um, and there's a huge debate about these things, whether they were on the graves or in the graves. And frustratingly, ours have all been out of context, so we can't contribute to that debate. These would have been lovely objects. They would have been painted almost certainly. You can see from this one and this one and this one, these, these kind of sunk spaces where the terminals were of crosses or, or the central boss of the cross. These probably contain metallic or glass insets. So these would have been very kind of vividly um, decorated, decorated objects. And we found a whole series. We, we, we've increased the the um, uh, the total number of, the, of these known name stones by by, by a, quite 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 an impressive amount. Most of ours have been a bit fragmentary, not always in great condition. But nonetheless, you know, it's clear what they are, and they fit into this tradition of of small, small, bar, small markers are seemingly associated with with burial in in some way. And this is Christina Smith in the Department of Archaeology is at Durham is, is currently working on these. Um, most of these are, I and mean, you can see they they all fit into that kind of broad group of of round headed things. In some cases, they're quite eroded. In other cases, the the um, stonework remains really quite quite crisp. So whether some of these are protected or and others were exposed to the elements is not entirely entirely clear at clear at this date. Um, what's interesting is really looking at these these things in, in, in a bit more detail is I, I think there's a lot of crossover in design and almost in broader intention between these and some of the big gospel books and, and, and manuscript traditions this period. If you can imagine, this is actually, this, some of these things are more or less the same size as gospel books. They are, uh, would have been, as I said, they would have been painted, they would have been decorated with these cross images on the front of the name stones. They are very reminiscent of some of the cross marked carpet pages from things like the Lindisfarne Gospels. And even in the way the, 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 the words are laid out and, and these objects are prepared, it kind of seems to reference the world of manuscript culture. So example, on, on this 
fragment of namestone we found found you can see that actually we're ruling out the, the guidelines for the for for the words and letters to be put in, uh, just like uh, the, the the lines were ruled out in on manuscripts uh, of this period, uh, and also I think this perhaps implies that some of these things were prepared in advance, and they you know that if, if they knew if if, if this is being uh, prepared specifically for a known, individ known individual. They'd know how long his name was. They wouldn't need to prepare blank slots. So it kind of suggests that be, maybe these things are being produced in advance and then filled in with the names, specific names, as and when they are required. And here we see an example. This is this is from the uh, the Lindisfarne Gospels. And again, you've got that same kind of ruling, careful ruling of the page with the smaller gaps before the next line, uh, in exactly the same way can see see on some of our some of our stones so i think you need to see the sculpture and the manuscripts and presumably other visual arts as well as all in as as kind of media forms which are all interacting with each other and all in all in dialogue and we've got work going on in the department at the moment looking for evidence of, of, of survival of things like pigments on on these kind of materials um, we've got other kinds of sculpture. Well, I'll, I'll talk more about uh, some of it later on. But here, again, this leads us back to Adrian's talk. On the left, we've got a, a little fragment of stone. It's about probably about two foot high when it's all put together. This is a classic archaeological story of finding the bottom bit one season and the top fragment two years two years later. Uh, but handily, they all stuck together. And you can see what we've got is a cross with those slightly expanded terminals, quite typical of sculpture from the community of St. Cuthbert, and on it either side these little flanking crosslets. Now what's interesting is there's no obvious comparisons with those from anywhere in the heart of Northumbria, so no, in the sculptural material from Northumberland and Durham, we don't have anything like that. But lo and behold, when we look over at uh, Whithorn, we have this. It's the so-called Golgotha stone. I mean, it's, and the first thing to say, it's, it's very, very similar in size as well but you can see we've got a very similar layout we've got these slightly expanded terminals on the central cross we can't see whether there's any decoration on that central boss because of where the break is but again we've got these two supplementary side things so apart from anything this this kind of bit of sculpture is unique to to eastern or, or central northumbria but it does have the just show these connections with with Whithorn, which as we know was a, was a northumbrian uh, diocesan center in uh, in, in, in this period. Um, we've got other smaller fragments of sculpture, uh, and a lot of it is very fragmented, it's worth saying. Here we've got a tiny corner of something, and again, it's it's not much, but it does fit very clearly into the broader tradition of uh, standing cross shafts associated from places from 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 Northumbrian uh, monastic sites. Um, so here's some examples of which which Christina Smith has, has put put together. Um, so again, it's clear that at some point uh, these cross shafts were really substantially fragmented. This is this is a you know it's a chip off an old block, really quite literally. But it, it does imply that this cross shaft at least must have been really quite heavily broken up, which perhaps kind of reminds us of some of the fragmented sculpture from places like Port Mahomac. Um, other other sculptural curiosities we found. This thing, it's about the same size as one of the name stones and this nice kind of red sandstone. It's clearly been pre pre prepared as a, as a blank, but we've got this very faint um, cross shape image on it. And you can see it's different from the, the name stones. There you can see it a little bit, a little bit more clearly. And it, I wonder whether we're seeing something which was either a kind of homemade attempt by someone to make their own name slab who didn't quite understand, or whether we've got some kind of design or motif piece for something else. And although that design, that kind of cross-shaped design of those circles doesn't link in with other design elements on name stones, we do find this kind of layout quite commonly on, on manuscripts from broadly the 8th century uh, and later. So it, it is a kind so again, I wonder whether perhaps there's, there's somebody maybe even trying to sketch out a, a manuscript design, but I mean, that's, that's hypothesis, but it remains a very unusual uh, an idiosyncratic piece of work we don't really understand. It's not all burials, it's not all sculpture and graves. We do have evidence for other kind of activity. We've got increasing evidence for industrial activity, uh, particularly 
down here. Ignore this big hole. This big, big hole is very interesting, but it's a Norman lime kiln. So we'll, we'll put that aside uh, for the moment. But to the south of it, we've got increasing levels of evidence for metal working. Iron smithing, but we've also got dumps of copper alloy working debris. We've got some hints of crucibles. We've got splash of molten copper alloy. Frustratingly, no moulds yet. I'm still crossing my fingers for that. Um, but we have got the carbon 14 dates uh, attached connected to some of the features so we've got this traces of a structure and these these shallow pits which seem to be connected to the metal working and again the carbon 14 dates come out quite nicely as as kind of eighth eighth ninth century so we can be happy that that is uh, certainly early medieval rather than later other objects some of you will be familiar with our central object here this is a, a glass gaming piece which we found in the cemetery area not specifically in a grave just generally within in in the in in in, in the makeup material of the cemetery uh, it's very small about a centimeter and a half high but clear parallels with gaming pieces from a broader north sea cultural province i think it's probably the best way of describing it so on the left we've got the uh, the beautiful object from dundurn which i have to reluctantly accept is nice as nars uh, but other examples and from kind of emporia and and, and trading sites uh, on on the eastern shores of the North Sea and the Baltic, so a very similar one from Gross Stromkundorf. These objects had little holes in the bottom, which were probably meant to go into wooden pegs on gaming boards. Um, initial publicity about this kind of tries to emphasise that, that it might be Viking, which I think is is very is, is a hard sell. I think it's probably best to see this as part of a shared cultural inheritance across our our, our broad zone. So here we've got Pictish, Northumbrian, and and kind of. Baltic uh, examples. And I think this, this also emphasizes the role of someone like Lindisfarne as being more than purely a monastery. It's, it, it's an important site for the exchange of ideas, but also the, the exchange of, of goods, um, which I'll come back to in a moment. We've also got lots of evidence for faunal remains. Luckily, unusually for the Northeast, bone preservation is remarkably good, as you've already seen. And we've got the usual set of, of, of bones. So we've got Kind of horses, cattle, deer, pig, sheep, sheep, goat, dog, hare. Then we've got wild, wild fowl coming through. So you've got geese and chickens. And also they're clearly eating seabirds. We've got evidence for consumption of puffin and gull and, and guillemot. Now, I've never had puffin, but I've met I have met people who have eaten puffin, and apparently it's pretty grim. But it 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 does show that people are 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 using using those those maritime resources. Certainly. In present day, and certainly in recorded history, puffin have never actually been on, uh, nested on Lindisfarne. So they're, they're probably being brought over from Inner Farne, being hunted as, as foodstuff and brought over from Inner Farne to be eaten. We've also got a, a fantastic selection of evidence for other kinds of maritime, maritime resources. We've got great evidence for fish consumption. Uh, including fish from a range of ecological niches from both shallow waters, mud flats, but also out into the North Sea. So we've got things like cod and quite big cod, which imply they're probably being fished from quite a long way out in the in the North Sea. We've also got evidence for consumption of shellfish, they're eating oysters and winkles and whelks. Um, so they're really, they're really exploiting all those, those ecological niche, niches. We've also got evidence for consumption of seal and whale. Um, on the right, you can see a fragment of whale bone from Ark and Midden area, and there's butchery marks on it. We've had, a, we've had some, there's some work being done on this, and it's almost certainly probably from a, a, a member of the, of the Globus cephalini family of, of whales, so that includes false killer whales and, um, and, and uh, a couple of other species. They're probably not actively whale hunting. It's more likely that they were um, making the most of whales and um, uh, related animals, related to Teishai, which were um, uh, beaching themselves on, on the coast. The seals, there's big seal colonies on the island and on the surrounding islands and the farns. We know from the life of Columba that the monks of Iona felt themselves to have proprietorial rights over local seal colonies. So presumably that's what's going on here. Uh, I mean, whales and seals are full of fat, so incredibly calorific food. Uh, and they're probably using the hide as well. There's, there's textual references to the use of hide from, from whales and seals for rope and sails in, in, in the North Sea world. 
another nice little find, I'm sorry it's a slightly out of focus picture, are these tiny, these tiny beads. These are the um, probably from a, a, a salmon, um, uh, the, the vertebrae, and they, these holes have actually been drilled or enlarged. There's a natural hole in these bones, but they have been drilled and enlarged. And these, these date from, I think the burial, I have, to, I have to check the C14 date, but I think the burial was, was kind of 9th, 10th century. So very early evidence for some kind of bead. And this was is, this is clearly placed within a, in a grave. So it's probably pushing it to call these a rosary, but I think these must have acted to some kind of, of broader class of prayer bead. Uh, and certainly, um, we, there are other examples of the specific use of uh, fish vertebrae for rosary and prayer beads known from the, the, the later, later medieval period. Other, other small objects of material culture assemblage is small but nice. We've got this fragment of a uh, comb uh, with uh, a very, very, very ephemeral runic inscription on it. This is Anglo-Saxon runes, not Norse runes. I, I had a bet it was going to say comb, but it's actually, it says something something ede which might be a a name um of someone so it might list someone's literally scrawling their name on this on this object um and we're getting coins coins although the northumbrian kings issued coins those coins had a much greater circulation in the south of the northumbrian kingdom so essentially day era which is broadly speaking yorkshire in the south of durham we don't have much evidence for coin circulation in the north beyond coin hoards, there's a big coin hoard from Bambra, big one from Hexham. We're getting a, a, a reasonable scatter of these things and finding you know, three or four every year. Uh, and these fit broadly into that, uh, that kind of eighth, ninth century century period. And again, most of Northumbrian, we've got at least one from, from Wessex. And they're, they're attesting to that role of, of Lindisfarne as, as a centre for trade uh, and exchange. And it's more, it's more than just a, a monastery. So that brings us to the, the, the kind of curious story of what's happening uh, in, in the later phases. And I said, traditionally, you will read everywhere that the monastery is deserted uh, as the monks flee the Vikings, uh, moving into Norham, and then ultimately starting that journey, which winds them up in Durham at, at the beginning of the 11th century. Now, I think there's lots of problems with that, both on kind of just practical issues. It's like if you're running away from the Vikings, you do, you go away more, you know, you, you, don't, you don't just run 10 miles down the road and up the nearest river. That doesn't really get you away from the Vikings. Um, the Viking army of this period was as much land-based as sea-based. So, you know, going inland was, was no, no, no guarantee of safety. So, the, so trying to explain the move to Norham as a, flee, as, as a flight from the Vikings doesn't really stand up particularly. Um, but as I said, we, ha we are starting to see a critique by historians of this narrative too. The story of this double departure uh, from, from Lindisfarne, uh, the move to Norham, and then the move elsewhere, ending up in Chesterley Street in Durham, is primarily based on documentary sources from the, um, from the 11th, 12th century. But there's a great PhD uh, being published at the moment in various, in various journal articles from Neil McGuigan, uh, from the Department of, Arch uh, Department of History at, at St Andrews, who's actually taken up the baton and actually said, right, let's ignore these later Norman documentary sources. Let's look at the evidence for uh, the documentary sources from the period, from the 10th century, of which there are a small amount. And he's coming up with some quite interesting different narratives, which we, which throwing things up in the air, and we'll come on to those in a second. But I think the key thing is what's clear is we can't rely on the traditional story as providing a framework for understanding what's going on in the later phases of Lindisfarne. For example, in our cemetery, we've got a curious cluster of burials in the, in the southwest corner of our, our eastern trench. Um, most of our graves are to shallow and intercutting. But in here we've got a, a, a very different set of graves. We've got a very deeply cut grave here and then we've got this, I'm sorry I, I can't find a decent excavation photo, we have got one but I couldn't access one. But you can see this burial here where it is got marked by a curb which stands which is above ground level and actually the corners of the curbs are actually slightly upstanding. Uh, so it's a very distinctive burial which would have been visible from above above the ground. What's interesting is it attracts a, a group of burials around it and a big charnel pit next to it as well. Now this burial right up hard against it, so hard that actually the, 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 the south side of the burial grave is actually the slab we see here, is deep and unusually 
it's a chest burial, which is, these chest burials are a phenomenon which are only really found in Northumbria. This is the burial of individuals in big wooden chests marked with lots of metal. Um, these are more than coffins. Crucially, I mean, the general assumption is that these are probably pieces of furniture which have a, have a use life, not only as, as containers for burials. Uh, apart from anything, unless we're going through the, 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 the kind of, uh, go down the rabbit hole. Generally speaking, coffins don't need to be locked. You're not normally worried about people either escaping for coffins or trying to get into coffins. These objects with great big lock plates like we've got from our grave are, are probably more general pieces of furniture which have a, have a use later as, as, as graves. Um, so we've got this one here. And in our latest excavation series, in our latest excavation last year, we excavated the tomb shrine itself. And within that was another one of these graves uh, in, 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 in a chest. Um, and these date broadly kind of eighth, ninth century. So they could fit within the accepted chronology for everybody leaving Lindisfarne in the, 10th, in, in the ninth century. But we've got an interesting set of finds in association with it. We, on, in, in, the, in the stuff on top of our tomb shrine, we've got a, a, a coin of Edward the Confessor, obviously kind of in early to mid 11th century. So clearly from the gap when the, when the monks aren't meant to be there and before they come back. We've also got this fragment of green porphyry. Green porphyry is a stone which is, comes from one island in the East Mediterranean, but is used uh, quite widely in early medieval Christianity in things like portable shrines, portable altars. Our fragment is clearly sawn on one side and um, uh, polished on, on the other. Uh, and what's interesting in this case is um, when we look at the dates and where, where the other examples of these things have been found. So example, broadly speaking, and I know Adrian's been looking at this in, in more detail, the kind of green porphyry is coming up from sites which are Irish sites, northern sites in, in Shetland and uh, Orkney. So broadly, they're coming from the world of the Hiberno Norse, um, which, which is interesting because that would put the date there again, Ninth or probably 10th, maybe even into the, into the 11th century. And certainly we know that actually, despite the traditional narratives, the monks of Lindisfarne got a lot more out of the Vikings than the Vikings ever got out of them. By, by, they, by, the, by the 10th century, the, monk, the community of St. Cuthbert is actually putting Viking kings on the throne of Northumbria. Um, and the Viking kings are showering the community of St. Cuthbert with gifts. So I wonder whether actually something like this, this green porphyry, would actually fit quite nicely as, as something being gifted to the community of St. Cuthbert on Lindisfarne by, by a, a Viking, a Viking uh, benefactor. We've also got quite clear carbon-14 dating of that our cemetery is continuing into use into the 10th century after everybody's meant to have gone. So not only do we have continued use of burials, but actually it looks like this entire little tomb shrine complex continues to be attracting devotion and uh, burials, although starting off perhaps in the ninth century, the tomb shrine itself is probably ninth century, it carries on attracting attracting individuals. Interestingly, we, in, in, more, in our latest season, we started to pick up a line of stones just, just, uh, just outside our trench edge here, we expanded our trench slightly. So I wonder whether we're starting to find hints of some kind of small burial chapel or burial enclosure, like, like we saw uh, earlier on with, with um, the Whithorn. Other evidence of kind of Viking period activity, a, a fairly crude but, but distinctive fragment of uh, a hammerhead cross, a, 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 a diagnostically uh, 10th century really cross type associated with broadly Anglo-Scandinavian sculptural traditions. Here's our, our fragment on the left, but here's some other nice other examples from the same, from North, elsewhere in, in Northumbria. Which leads us more generally on onto one of the elephants in the room with Lindisfarne. Uh, here, here's, here's some work being done by, by Christina Smith looking at the uh, Lindisfarne sculptural assemblage. And what's clear is we've got our name stones, of course, and then we've got all these other cross shafts. Um, and most fit in, well, well, not most, some fit in the seventh to ninth century, where one would expect them to. But actually, the majority of sculpture from Lindisfarne, and, and I think, probably say the best sculpture, the most elaborate, complex, nicely, nicely uh, constructed sculpture, actually dates in the period after 875 when the monks uh, are meant to have gone. Obviously, we have to allow for some subjectivity and stylistic dating, 
but I think it's pretty clear we're looking at a period where the most impressive sculpture from the island is, is after everyone's meant to have left. So we've got increasing evidence for uh, activity on Lindisfarne as not only not fading away after the monks meant to have left, uh, a lot of scarecrows quotes around meant to have left, um, but actually if anything, if, if we were looking at this without this historical uh, text, you'll narratives we'd be saying it's the 9th and 10th century which is a period where we see the greatest flowering of monastic activity on on Lindisfarne and actually um, from Neil McGuigan's work he's been pointing out that actually there continue to be textual references to a presence of something on on Lindisfarne Lindisfarne continues to be raided through the through the late 9th into the 10th century um, not just by the Vikings, by the Scots, which I think is quite important to, to remember as well. Uh, for example, the 941 raid on Lindisfarne by Olaf Guffredson also hits Oldham and Tyningham, uh, both further up the, the coast, to the north, both sites which were had religious presence. So I think there's no reason to imagine they weren't attacking Lindisfarne precisely because it was a, a monastery. Um, now, Neil, Neil McGuigan's work is, has much broader and much more broader implications, and amongst which are that Cuthbert's bones stay at Norham much, much later than people realised. Uh, and that's perhaps a subject for, for a different, a different a different paper. But what's clear, I think, is that the, the traditional story of, of a departure from Lindisfarne in the ninth and late mid to late ninth century and, and the kind of the move and the subsequent destination at Durham in the early in the late 10th century actually is not something can, and it can really be sustained either sculpturally, archaeologically, or, 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 or in terms of textual evidence. So that kind of draws me to an end now. Obviously, this is work in progress. There's a lot to unpack, particularly about the broader Viking impact, or, or I, I would argue relative lack of impact of the Vikings on, on Lindisfarne. Um, I think what we can see is that there's a potential for archaeology and revisiting documentary sources to start to write quite different narratives. The, the, one of, one of the challenges with historical sources is we don't get many new historical sources, but the, Neil McGuigan's work has shown the value of going back to what we've got and looking at it in a new way, framing it in a new way. And in terms of archaeology, I think we can see the, the value of just of digging. And actually, I mean, I think most of the audience here wouldn't subscribe to the notion of um, Linda's of archaeology being a being a um, subservient to history but I think you know I think what here is we've really shown that archaeology can present quite radically different different narratives to what the historical the historical sources um, might might suggest so I'm going to leave it there um, there's a the usual uh, try and get to the next page the usual acknowledgements I forgot to put a picture on this final slide uh, uh, but obviously as always with these big projects, it can't it can't be done without either my, my collaborators at Dick Ventures or the many people who've done everything from let us go on their land, keep spades in their barns, or give us some money for carbon 14 notes. So I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. David. That was that was really fantastic. Um, and please, if you have uh, if you have a few questions, we've got time for a few questions, then please post them in the chat. Can I ask if you, you, you sort of intimated that uh, Lindisfarne was um, probably a, a royal or secular, a secular centre before it was a monastery. And, and uh, even I know that many of the monasteries are associated with, with royal sites. Uh, if, if, it was, if it was likely that that was the case and, and the land was given over to monastic use, uh, would the same elite group be those present at Bamba? Uh, what, what's the relationship between the, the island and Bamba as a royal centre? Yeah, I mean, I mean Bamba is really close. I mean, it, you can see yeah. it straight, straight yeah, across. Yeah, yeah. And, and we, we, we know that kind of Oswald, his relics were kind of split between Bamba and Lindisfarne. We don't, I mean, we don't have clear documentary evidence, but you know, I, I think we can be confident enough that you know, it, but we know it's a royal foundation and we have yeah. evidence that there are other other uh, royal donations to it so one one would imagine that that is that was part of the royal patrimony which which was handed over we don't have that you know the trouble with northumbria is we don't have that charter evidence which divides which characterizes you know what we know of kind of places like kent and, and, and yes. mercia and wessex um but yeah I mean, it, it's clearly a royal monastery northumbrian kings retire there yes. um so very very important that royal support is fundamental yes. to its success 
Uh, and until someone asks another question, can can I ask uh, at what point did it become a village? W when when the later medieval priory was established, was it a village then, or did the village come even later than that? Yeah, I mean, I didn't really talk much about that later village. Is what's clear is that when the later priory is founded, the whole thing contracts. There's enough evidence. I mean, these early medieval monastic sites are big. You know, yeah, they, and unlike Iona, where most of most of the where the village kind of grows up to the south of the monastery, on Lindisfarne the village kind of grows up on top of most of the monastery. Just yeah. leave just leave that smaller area to the south. It, it, as far as we can tell. I, that village starts to develop at the same time as the foundation of the later later, later priory. The, the priory account rolls are talking about villagers, and from a little bit of work we did to the we did a little trench to the west of the village. What's clear is originally the medieval village went all the way to the western side of the island, where there's now a strip of fields, um, and we've got evidence there, which suggested really from the 12th century that, that yes. people are. So I think that's really where that. That comes and from. was that was that was that essentially a village owned by the priory as, as part of its own uh, manor, if you like, or or, or were, the, were they separate? Was the was the priory separate to the village, or, or did the village was the village owned by the priory? I mean, there's, there's later lords of the manor, but essentially, for all intents and purposes, they they, they are the landlords. They are yeah. they they own everything, and particularly they are kind of working with the village to exploit fishing, which is something we've yes. got textual evidence for. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank, thanks to all of our speakers today. Uh, it's, it's been really, really fantastic. Thanks to all of you uh, who gave up your Saturdays. Um, uh, I know that you work all week and, and you've given up your Saturday to, to participate in this conference. Um, we are hoping that we will do one this sort of time next year uh, and, and potentially have a face to face conference. We will keep uh, everyone in touch with that. Uh, I wonder if our four speakers, I can see you're still connected. Uh, if you had to make one comment about what this area of your profession really needs or, or what your own particular specialization really needs in the next years, what, what would you say that is most needed uh, to, to gain an even better understanding of, of this period and of the church in this time and life in this time? Dr. David, you're still alive. So oh, maybe you yeah. I mean, I mean, from a bit of government support for the universities would be nice, but we'll leave yeah. the politics aside. I think, um, and for me, what's interesting is is the, the potential that archaeological science is bringing in. We've already heard from Adrian the, the work with kind of isotopic analyses, and you know the, the, these techniques are developing all the time. So we're working with the Canadian University on techniques which can potentially, and don't ask me how. Uh, distinguish between not just whether they're eating uh, terrestrial diets or maritime stuff but actually specifically whether they're eating seal and whale rather than other fish so that kind of thing uh, uh the increased use of dna is going to be really ancient dna is going to be really interesting not and for me not so much for those big questions about population replacement and migration that kind of thing but for me it's about unpicking the communities who are using these cemeteries are the are I mean, i'd love to know whether our burials are they're clearly not the monks because we've got women and children um but whether these are people who are living on the island and related or are do we have a, a, a quite heterogeneous community of people coming to the island from elsewhere if so where are they coming from thinking about some of the isotopic work uh, again adrian showed with people coming from the broad area um so for me that's got a lot of a lot of potential to to unpick really and for us you know in, in, in a site where we've got relatively little material culture beyond you know a bit of sculpture a few coins it's the human remains and the animal remains which have that potential to really unlock a lot of the stories fantastic thank you dr david dr adrian what would you say I mean, you know, as David or anybody else would say, I mean, it's funding and support from the institutions, but that's uh, that's uh, the same as everybody else. Uh, I would also I would also just add much more work on archival materials. So I'm I'm now currently employed in the National Museum in Edinburgh, and uh, what I've been able to do uh, from there, without sort of uh, without excavating any new trenches, is 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 really quite exciting. Um, it's collaboration with lots of different specialists, ones that you wouldn't think to collaborate with. Just kind of show your material to everybody that you can and see what kind of ideas it sparks. Because, you know, when we're, when me as an archaeologist looks at 
yeah, the human remains and faunal remains, I see the potential for radiocarbon dates. Uh, but somebody who works on isotopes or DNA has several other layers of questions that they can maybe answer with looking at the human remains in alongside the faunal remains, which sort of shows what they're eating, what's going into their bodies. And that actually helps them calibrate their radiocarbon dates. It helps them calibrate their isotope analysis much better. And then if you add DNA pollen analysis, residue analysis to all of that, you can really get, yeah, a story of people's lives, like the human science uh, that is possible here, not just looking at the human remains, but the whole ecology of the site really has the potential to tell us new and different stories about what it was like to live as an early Christian or in early Christian times, and not just about, yeah, the liturgy and, and things that increasingly people don't know about haven't yeah. been raised in, is alien to people who come from other religious traditions. How do we make this relevant to other people, make it more human? And you can tell a religious story, uh, a story of, of a religion without making it an exclusively Christian story. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Adrian, and for your contribution today. Dr. Emma? Yeah, I think very similar in terms of like the, the scientific analysis that we can do with graves, um, but specifically making sure that we're not just targeting the most interesting looking graves for that scientific analysis. So, you know, it's very tempting to just radiocarbon date and isotope the graves with all the fancy stuff in them, um, but getting enough resources to try and get a genuine cross section of the whole spectrum of burial practice. Um, and because it's only by by knowing what what's normal for everyone that you can start to pull out what's genuinely different and interesting. Um, and of course, to do all of that, we need all the resources, more money. Yes. Et cetera. Fantastic. Thank you again for your contribution. And um, Professor Ken, maybe you'd say something and sum everything up for us. We can't, I can't hear you. I can't hear you, Professor. Can you, sorry, I, I want to hear, we all want to hear a last word from you. Can you log off, log off and log on again, can you? Okay, thank you, yes. Yes, sorry, I don't know what happened there to Professor Ken at the end. <laughs> He's left speechless. Uh, no, thank you so much, everyone who, who contributed in your wonderful presentations. Really, really wonderful. So interesting. Uh, and all of you who have uh, given up your time to be here. Thank you again. Um, I hope you have a wonderful rest of the afternoon and evening, and uh, we'll keep you in touch with whatever else we're doing. Some of these presentations will be available online on the conference website. Uh, in a day or so. So um, if you want to listen to them again, uh, you'll find them there. Thank you again to all of you who gave contributions. I'm really, really grateful. Uh, and thank you to everyone else. God bless you all. Take care now.